Come on, baby. Love you, Pastor Sam. Come on, who's excited to be in church this Labor Day weekend? Man, I'm excited. I'm excited. I've already had uh, been to the state fair twice. Come on, somebody. I think I'm. I think I'm still di- digesting some cheese curds. So, so, so don't mind me. But hey, it is. Uh, it's about that time for uh, to wrap up the cabins and to get into the fall flow of things. Uh, who is like me and just does love fall? Who just loves the season of fall? Loves the the fall drinks? Who uh, I'm gonna split the room. So sorry for any division that I cause. Who's the pumpkin person? Who's the pumpkin person? And and then the pumpkin flavor, okay? Where are my apple people at? My apple people at? That's, uh, in case you're wondering, I am an apple crisp girly. Just in case you're wondering. I am, I am. I love fall, and uh, I, love, I love church, so uh, I think today's gonna be a good uh, Sunday. You, are you with me? Say yes. Good, good, good. Well, hey, uh, I am excited to preach to you today. Um, we have, last uh, week, we had an amazing uh, Sunday. We just maybe... Uh, our staff, we call it just Artisan Sunday, with, uh, sharing the Artisan message. Pastor Sam preached an, an amazing message, kind of incorporating this new table that we have with, uh, with an amazing story of a man in our church who uh, offered this table as, a, as an offering of, of love and of generosity. And last Sunday was super awesome. We talked about the fact that you and I are crafted intentionally. You are made by an artisan God on purpose, for a purpose. And there are elements of our lives that are requiring us to craft our life intentionally. If we were made intentionally, we ought to live intentionally. Today, I want to talk about a piece of that that I think is so vital as we move into uh, our new rhythms of fall, whether we're going back into class, whether we're registering our kids for preschool. Oh my gosh, I'm putting my, th- uh, my three-year-old daughter in preschool this fall, so fall's going to hit different for me in our household. But as you jump into a new rhythm, a new season. I believe it's important to approach this new season with intentionality. And today, I want to talk about something. I want to. I want to. If you're taking notes, uh, the subject of this morning's uh, message is just on rest. It's just on rest. I want to talk about rest today. I want to talk about. Uh, crafting a rhythm of rest into your life so that you can live the life that God actually has for you. Um, If you have your Bible, you can open up to Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to jump right into the text. Um, And Hebrews is uh, is one of my favorite books. Um, Shout out to uh, Abe Mitchell. He's an awesome, stellar youth leader who's actually walking through Hebrews with a group of high school boys um, before Wednesdays. He doesn't just show up to church on Wednesdays. He's actually pouring into students' lives outside of Wednesdays, and he's walking through the book of Hebrews with these high school boys, and he's super smart, he's super intelligent, and he's the right person to do that because Hebrews is pretty dense. Somebody say dense. Hebrews is dense because it was written to uh, people who already had a, a wealth of knowledge of the biblical narrative, a wealth of knowledge of the, of the biblical history. So a lot of times when you and I read Hebrews, we kind of feel left out because there's some context that they reference to, kind of like some insider knowledge um, that we get to uh, then go and backfill. So let me backfill some of the things that, we, uh, that Hebrews is talking about here. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4 is speaking on rest. Let me hear you say rest. Let me hear you take a, let me hear you take a deep breath and say rest. Rest. Love it. Rest. Hebrews is talking about rest and how God's plan for his people was to enter the land of rest, the promised land. They were taken out of 400 years of slavery under the hand of Pharaoh in Egypt, being oppressed and being uh, abused day after day, uh, week after week, year after year. And he wanted, his plan was to move them into this place of oppression and rushing and abuse and move into a place of rest. But if you have heard of the story, you know that it doesn't go so smoothly. It doesn't just go from Egypt to the promised land. They had a process to that. And honestly, they prolonged the process that God even had in mind. And so we'll look in Hebrews chapter 4 of God's plan for rest and how that, how that applies to us today. So Hebrews chapter 4, verse, starting in verses 1, we'll read through verse 11. We'll skip around here. It says, now the promise of entering into God's rest is still for us today. Someone say amen. Amen. So we must be extremely careful to ensure that we all embrace the fullness of that promise and not fail to experience it. 
For we have heard the good news of deliverance, just as they, the Israelites, being delivered out of Egypt, just as they did, yet they did not join their faith with the word. Instead, what they heard didn't affect them deeply, for they doubted. For those of us who believe, faith activates the promise. Someone say, faith activates the promise. And we experience the realm of confident rest. They were going into the land of Canaan. They were on the cusp of the land of Canaan, and they sent spies into the land to scope it out, to send some intelligence out, to see what the new land was like. They hadn't ever seen it before. They send the spies out, and they come back, and they, and they have differing reports. Some of them say, it's awesome. The grapes are the size of cantaloupes. We got to go in. God's giving this to us. It's the land of milk and honey. It's the land where we get to rest and be who God created us to be. Let's go let's do it. Other people came back and said, hey, I don't know. There are giants. There are dangers. We might get hurt. We might uh, be in a tough spot if we go in this. I don't think that this is for us. And because they chose, the Israelites chose to believe the bad report about the promise that God had, they, they wandered in the desert for 40 years. Finishing in, or continuing in Verse 6, it says, those who first heard the good news of deliverance failed to enter into that realm of faith's rest because of their unbelieving heart. Yet the fact remains that we still have the opportunity to enter into the faith rest life and experience the fullness, the fulfillment of the promise. For God still has ordained a day for us to enter into it called today. In verse 8, it says, Now if the promise of rest was fulfilled when Joshua brought the people into the land, God wouldn't have spoken, uh, spoken later of another rest yet to come. So we can conclude that there is still a full and complete Sabbath rest waiting for believers to experience. As we enter into, as we enter in to God's Faith rest life, we cease from our own works, just as God celebrates his finished work and rests in them. So then we must be eager, someone say eager, to experience this faith rest life so that no one falls short by following the same pattern of doubt and unbelief. You see, the, the Israelites heard the message and heard the promise of rest, but they chose not to believe that it was for them. And they missed out on the life that God had for them. My question to you is, moving into this next season, whatever you're facing, whatever this next year holds for you, are you going to hear and are you going to receive the promise of rest or are you going to believe another thing? You are intentionally crafted on purpose by God. Therefore, you must craft your life intentionally. And in order to craft your life in with intention, rest must be a rhythm. And let's pray before we move on. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for the worship. We thank you for the gathering. We thank you for the people. And Lord, today, as we look to your word, God, I pray that you would um, expose any, any thoughts that we've been believing that keep us from entering the thing that you have for us. And God, I pray that the truth would come and the truth would set us free and allow us to experience this faith rest. Allow us to incorporate rhythms of rest into our lives so that we don't find ourselves burning out and missing out on the God life that you have for us. God, we open our hearts to you to, for you to speak to us. And it's in your mighty name we pray. Some, everybody said amen. amen and amen. So uh, we're moving into fall, and uh, actually this December will be, uh, will mark seven years for me living in Minnesota. So at, at December, at the end of this year, I will have lived in Minnesota longer than I lived in Arkansas. And I love claiming Arkansas. I love claiming the South. I love claiming sweet tea. I love like still like not knowing what snow is, like, oh, what is that? <laughs> But after this year, um, I, I, I will have to claim Minnesota as my, as my full-blown home, and I love it. Because I love Minnesota. I love, I love Minnesotans, but uh, it's so interesting that I have learned uh, Minnesotans just do small talk different than anywhere else. 
in the country. And, and it's so interesting because like we talk about the weather, we'll talk about like the Vikings disappointing us. Like we all have these different, um, I, uh, we had a, a, a guest speaker here this summer, his name was Brendan Washington. And I was, I had the pleasure of like hosting him around and, and taking him to, and t- taking him to the Mall of America, just spending some time with him, making sure he had a good experience here. Um, and he was asking before he got up to preach to a group of Minnesotans, what are Minnesotans like? What do they think about? What do they care about? And I, as I was sharing, I said, Minnesotans, Brennan, talk about the weather. And they always say that there's two seasons. And you know the two seasons. There's winter and, and construction season. <laughs> Minnesotans talk about the weather. And, and sure enough, um, the very next day, we're in Mall of America talking about the weather. And the person in front of us in Legoland, I could see he was chomping at the bit. He's like, he's like they're talking about the weather. <laughs> and, and, and he's like, are y'all talking about the weather? I was like, yeah, we're talking about the weather. And he said... Well, you know, in Minnesota, there's only two seasons. And Brennan looked at me like, oh, he was right. <laughs> so I, I, I love Minnesotans, and, and sure enough, it's, it's winter and construction season. Uh, but it's so interesting. Uh, but one, another thing that I have noticed that, that Minnesotans, that people, that humans like to talk about, is they love to talk about how busy their schedules are, and they love to talk about how tired their schedule is making them. If I ask you to raise your hand if you were busy and tired, I think every single human being in this room would put up both hands to show, man, I am busy, and man, I am am tired. I just think that that's, uh, those are two words that me, I have just erased out of my vocabulary. If somebody, if you come up to me and ask me how I am and I say, man, I'm busy, or I say, man, I'm tired, I give you permission to smack me straight across the face. Because we all are. We all are busy. Life moves so fast. Our schedules are so full. We're we're always seeing things on social media. We're always comparing ourselves to somebody else. Everybody is so busy and everybody is so tired. And it's so true and it's so real. And it's a reality of the world that we are living in. There's actually a thing. There's there's actually a condition, a, a, a description that a lot of psychologists use. It's called hurry sickness. It's called hurry sickness. It is a condition here. I'll read it. Hurry sickness is, um, is, let's see, hurry sickness. I'm going to write it down. Oh, is by definition, it's a behavior pattern characterized by a continual rushing and and anxiousness, an overwhelming and continual sense of urgency, as if that isn't bad enough. It also, descri- it's also is defined as a malaise in which a person feels chronically short of time and so tends to perform every task faster and to get flustered when encountering any kind of delay. And I know you have done one or two or all of these things. How many of you have ever uh, been at Target or been at a grocery store and moved from one checkout line to the other because there was less, uh, less people in this line than the other line? <laughs> Maybe pulling up to a red light, you count the cars in this lane and you count the cars in this lane. That one's got one less. Oh, I'm going over here. <laughs> like that would make a difference. Or Maybe you've gotten dressed so fast that you walk outside and realize that you put your shirt inside out <laughs> or, you've, or, you've, or you've done something like that. Or maybe you've uh, put your, or you sleep in your daytime clothes in order to save time in the morning. And if you did that this morning, hey, we accept all people here at Artisan. <laughs> but they're efficient, somebody says. I'm efficient. That's a three, that's a three on the Enneagram right there. <laughs> but it's so real that none of us feel like we have enough time to do the things that we're doing. And what I want to pose as a question is, I wonder if it's a resource problem or I wonder if it's a rest problem. So many of us hoard our energy and hoard our time because we don't feel like we have enough. God knew what he was doing when he gave us 24 hours in a day. God knew what he was doing putting you where you are with the responsibility that you have, with the kids that you have, with the job that you have. What if this feeling of not having enough isn't a resource problem, it's a rest problem? And what if we need a new solution? It's interesting, tomorrow's Labor Day. And, you know, summer is beginning, begins with Memorial Day and ends with Labor Day. 
And uh, it's interesting, I did some research of like, oh, Memorial Day didn't, wasn't always called Memorial Day, it used to be called Decoration Day. It was a holiday that was put in place after the Civil War because all states at that time lost family members. There were people who, who died in the war and they wanted to remember and decorate their graves. So everybody would take a day off from work to remember uh, the, the fallen soldiers. This was right after the Civil War, but late, late, late into the 1900s, or excuse me, the 19th century, so late 1800s, um, it was in the middle of the Industrial Revolution. America and the world was on 10, like producing everything, building factories, doing all these things, maximizing everything. And there were so many people who were working 80 hour work weeks. They were facing terrible work conditions and there was so much tension that was being raised that eventually there were, there were riots, there were unions. It was this crazy time in history where people would raise up to get their voice heard and there was actually life that was lost because of people speaking out. And the government was like, oh my gosh, Grover Cleveland, he was, a, he, was a, he was a president at the time. And he was like, we need to do something different. We need to do something different than we've ever done before. And they quickly enacted Labor Day as a federal holiday in order to give people uh, a day off so that they could rest and recuperate and go back to their whatever schedule that they had. I think it's so interesting how far we let our lives go before we take a day off. What if you took a day off before you were pulling your hair out and super stressed out and about to give up on everything? What if you gave, what if you gave yourself a rhythm of rest to keep yourself from getting to that point? What if? I believe that's closer to the life that God actually has for you than, than always having a day off for damage control. What if you took a day off to invest in yourself and invest in your family? And there's uh, so many, and there are lies that, that, that we believe that keep us from rest. You know, whenever, even as I'm talking right now, you're going through your, how many hours you have in class. You're going through what your work schedule looks like. I can't do this because of this. I can't do this because of this. And today, all I want to do is talk about some lies that I have believed. I'll just be honest and vulnerable with lies that I believe that keeps me from resting the way that I should. And I just want to present some truth for you to consider for you to ponder as you go into this next season because I believe that to live a life intentionally, we have to craft into our lives rhythm of rest. So here are some lies. Here's some, here's, here, I've got a list. Here's the first one. And maybe, maybe you've thought this. If I rest, I'll be behind. If I rest, ah, I'm going to be behind. I already know how much is on my do list. I already know how much is on my honey to-do list. And if I rest... I'll be behind. Look at everyone else. They're not stopping. They're not resting. If I rest, I'm going to be behind. In a moment, we're going to turn to uh, Matthew chapter 11. You can turn there just to prep. But uh, all throughout the Bible, Jesus speaks, and, and it's spoken of like agricultural references, uh, references about farm, illustrations about farming, field, and all these sorts of things. And one of my favorite images in my mind is that of a yoke. Not an egg yolk, but a yolk for oxen. And if, if you're familiar with it, uh, it uh, still, let me explain it to you. There might not pe- be people who've heard this verse before in the room. A yoke is a, uh, a, stru- is a structure, is, a, is an apparatus that you would put on an oxen that you would attach to a, a tiller or a plow that the ox would then pull through a field and, and turn the ground over so that you can plant seeds and, and prepare for the, next, for the next time. And oftentimes you wouldn't just use one ox, you'd use two. And the interesting thing about it is you wouldn't put two oxen the same age typically on the yoke because the yoke wasn't just about getting the line straight in the field, plowing straight lines. It's not just about uh, the direction, but it was a thing about pace because young ox, all stout, all, all ready to go, would just go so fast, they would tear up the ground and destroy the field before it was time to plant. So what they would do is they would take an older ox who has learned the pace, learned the pattern, learned the rhythm of how to plow a field, and they would put a young ox with the older ox. So when the young ox wants to go as fast as he can, as strong as he can, the entire time he's yoked to somebody greater than him. So he says, wait, 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 hold on. We got we to slow down. We got we to gotta slow down and we got to make sure that this is straight so that we don't do more damage rather than uh, being fruitful. 
And what God is asking of us is that we don't go off as a lone ox somewhere, but that we would actually yoke our lives to the pace of Jesus. A lot of us want the power of Christ, but we don't want the pace of Christ. Jesus took a day off every single week. He was a good Jewish man. He followed the law. Jesus Sabbathed every week. Jesus, we we don't have a recording of Jesus ever jogging. I bet he was fit, but he didn't jog. He didn't run. He walked at the pace of grace. And guess what? He was never late for anything. We want the power of Christ, but we don't want the pace of Christ. And it's so interesting that sometimes we want to get ahead of the one who we actually should be following. And we need to learn from him. You see, um, Jesus walked slow enough, moved slow enough where he allowed himself to be interrupted. C.S. Lewis is, is, is quoted by saying that who you are when you're interrupted is the real you. Who you are when you're interrupted is the real you. And a lot of times we, we miss that. Let's look at Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. It says, uh, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle, I am lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The yoke of speed has driven so many people to burnout, stress, and and, and so much negativity. But the yoke of Jesus is light and leads to life. If the lie that I have believed at times is, if I rest, I'll be behind, a truth that I just want to remind you of today is longevity is better than speed. Longevity is better than speed. You might get there faster if you decide to never take a day off, never spend time with your kids, never take a time to breathe, but I don't know how long you can keep that up. I don't know how long I could keep this up. If I continue to, if I show up to everything I can show up to, I tell you, I want to be preaching. I want to be ministering. I want to be in ministry for the rest of my life. I don't want to just be somebody who was uh, uh, quick, a flash in a pan. I want longevity in everything that I feel like God has called me to do. God doesn't call you to things just for a summer or just for a fall or just for a semester. What the things that God calls you to, that needs longevity. So we need to build in rest. Longevity is better than speed. A, a couple more, a couple more lies. I got three, three more thoughts to, to share with us today. If, here's a lie that, that we can believe sometimes. If I rest, I'll miss out on life. If I rest, I'll miss out on life. Can I just tell you, if you aren't resting, you are missing out on life. Because what are you defining as life? What are you defining as life? Production or presence? You want to know the best thing about God? Is when he shows up. When he's present. You want to know the best thing that my dad ever did for me? Just being there. His presence. Not when he produced something for me or gave me something. The best gift that you can give to the people around you is your presence rather than feeling the need that you don't have enough time to produce the things that God's calling you to do. If you're not missing, if you, if you don't rest, you'll miss out on life. So many times I, w- I want to challenge you to, I want to encourage you to check in with yourself. Man, how is your soul? How are my emotions? I believe this like 80%, 90% of life is, uh, 90% of loving well is just being emotionally healthy and spiritually awake. Uh, Because God forbid, I crush in every area of my life. I get up at 4 a.m., I read the Bible for three hours, I fast and pray and cast all the demons out of my neighbor's house. Like, God forbid, I do all this stuff, and and then Francesca throws up on the carpet, not the tile, and I go ballistic. God forbid I crush at my job, crush at these things, uh, and produce so much, and then I'm not a loving person. Rest allows you to be a loving person. I'm not the most loving person you'll ever meet. I'm not. But when I'm well rested, I do pretty all right. When I'm not, watch out. <laughs> no. 
but 80%, 90% of loving well is just, being, is just being rested and being emotionally healthy. And we don't want to just be emotionally healthy, healthy just so that we can be happy, just so these things. No, you are your best self. You love well when you're emotionally healthy. John 10, verses 7 through 10. This is Jesus saying again. Uh, Jesus again saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in. He will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they would have life and have it abundantly. When I'm not resting, in the life that God has for me, it doesn't matter how much I, uh, I pray, how many podcasts I listen to, how much I go to church. I go to church a lot. Doesn't matter. If I'm not resting well, uh, it doesn't matter how hard I try. Rest matters not because you will be more happy, but because you will be more loving. The people around you in your life need a more loving you. The world that is peering in and wondering what Christians are like in 2024, who are, gonna look, who are gonna wonder what Christians look like in the middle of an election cycle, need to know what a loving you looks like. Next one is, is uh, if I rest, I won't feel rested. Come on, where are the moms out out there? <laughs> if I rest, I won't feel rested. If I take a day off, I already know, Pastor Philip, you're telling me to take this day off. If I take a day off, if I rest, there's going to be the things nagging on me. I'm still going to get text messages. If I take a day off, if I rest, I won't feel rested. You see, re- this is why rest needs to be a rhythm. This is why rest needs to be a rhythm. It needs to be consistent. Think about it. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll use this as an example. I recently started going, again, to a chiropractor. And it's a really dope chiropractor because, like, they do, like, x-rays and they, like, take posture pictures and all this stuff. So I got to learn about what a healthy back looks like and all these things. And they show me my back. And I'm like, what letter is that? It's not I. <laughs> um, I, I'm looking at my, uh, my x-rays, and I can see, you know, my, uh, my misalignments and different things. And they're saying um, it, it took some time for my back to, to find itself into this situation, in, into this alignment. So they put me on a plan, a plan of going in and getting adjusted multiple times a week for a certain amount of time. And then you can back off of that, and then you can back off of that. Because, and I asked them, I was like, well, how much happens whenever you get adjusted for the first time. And like this like super fit, strong person, like the chiropractor looked at me and they're like, not much. I'm like, well, why am I paying you? But what they said is, is that it's, you need to build in a rhythm of adjustments. It took your back this long in order to get into this position. So it's going to take some time and a rhythm in order to correct it. It takes the right rhythms to come into alignment with God. I think we get so caught up in binging stuff. We get so caught up in binging shows, binging uh, people or relationships. Um, you can't really binge the way of God. The way of God is a rhythm. The way of God is a slow drip. What you need is something worked into your rhythm, into your week, so that you can take the breath you need, so, you th- so that you can get the drink of water that you need to keep going. Psalms 23, verses 1 through 3 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lay down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters, and he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You know, it takes time to come into alignment with God. And this is our worship to God and even supersedes how we feel Man, I know that first Sabbath day, that first day you say, you know what, I'm not going to work. I'm not going to do these duties. I'm going to take time. I'm going to pray. I'm going to set this day aside or half day aside and spend time with my kids, things that fill my soul. It might feel more tiring than it does refreshing, but that is an act of faith that we uh, align with the rhythms of God. Here's a, a truth that I want you to know. If burnout takes time, restoration takes time, and you're worth it. 
God would say that you're worth it. He didn't design this as a rule, for a cage for you to live in. He designed this for something for your heart to flourish. You deserve it. If burnout takes time, restoration takes time. Then the keys can go ahead and come on up. A lie that I've believed at times is rest is what feels good. Rest is what feels good. One of my favorite pastimes, and me and some youth leaders have, have, have been there, a place in Minneapolis is called Embrace North. It is a place where it's like a gym membership place. We go get a membership. I've just been there a couple of times, visited. It's not gym equipment. It is a place. Some of you guys are going to love this. Some of you guys are going to hate this. It's a place where you, it is just saunas and ice baths. <laughs> it is a place where you go and you sit in a super hot room filled with strangers <laughs> and then you go and sit in this so cold, almost freezing cold water. And I, you would think, I and mean, I know you might be thinking like, why would you do that? I know that is, it is so uncomfortable to do this. It is, I remember when, when my brother-in-law invited me out to this, I was like, that sounds really uncomfortable, but I'm going to try. Yeah, sure. Let's go. And I remember leaving a sauna and ice bath session uh, after walking through an uncomfortable situation I felt so like weirdly like relieved. My, like my inflammation was down. My joints felt great. And, uh, and it was something that was uncomfortable to my flesh, but ended up having benefits that I didn't even realize. Turns out there's so many different benefits to going sauna and an ice bath. And so many times as humans, we experience a tension of like, man, uh, my flesh is tired, but my soul is tired. My, my body is tired, I wanna just, I wanna veg, I wanna numb, but also my soul is tired. I wanna encourage you to not always rest your soul, by, rest your flesh by numbing yourself to life. Ask yourself the question, what do I need to do to replenish my soul? Galatians 5 says, but I say walk by the spirit and not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. Wisdom helps us to know how and when to rest both. See, serving your flesh is not always the best rest. And I would encourage you to learn to love the rest that you need. Learn to, to love the rest that you need. Putting down your phone is uncomfortable for me. I don't know about you, but man, sitting in silence, you know, sometimes we treat God like our grandma. It's like, yeah, I love you, but I don't know how to sit with you. <laughs> you know, it's uncomfortable. It's like, I know you, I know you know me. Since I was young, this is preaching right now. <laughs> Learn to love the thing that replenishes your soul. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes it's a walk without your phone. Sometimes it's a time of prayer. Sometimes it feels like being stretched. Sometimes it feels like being something that's uncomfortable. But I believe to craft a life that God has for us means to learning the thing, learning to love the thing, that your soul needs. Last thing is I'll rest when I'm done. I'll rest when I'm done. And so many things in life are never done. It's the, the, there's always something else to move on to. And even whenever we finish something, there's always the next thing that takes place. I think a wonderful thing about God is that he has the ability to finish well and he has the authority to tell us when things are finished. All we have to do is to be faithful in the middle. He was somebody in Genesis chapter 2 that looked at the wonder of creation, wonder of all the animals that he created, and he said, that, that's finished. That's good. I'm going to rest. I love that. Jesus was stretched out on the cross for you, paying the debt of the sin that you and I have racked up, he paid for it so that he could forgive us and wash us clean. Jesus, hanging on the cross, separate from his father, paying, for the, paying the penalty for our sins, had the authority to say, that's finished. That's taken care of. That's done. 
And the wonderful thing about rest is that we rest in what he has done, not when we're done. Resting in the middle of a process that's unfinished reminds you that God is the one who finishes things, not you. God is the one who brings things about, not you. All our job is to do is to be faithful. And part of being faithful is sometimes taking a break, taking a breath of air, taking a walk, enjoying what he's created, replenishing your soul so that you can continue. And some of you, you think of a day off or or, or building this into a week or, or, or a rhythm seems a lot. I just want to say that there's grace for you today. Start where you're at. Maybe it's a half a day. Maybe it's a certain time where you say, you know what, I'm going to put my phone away. I'm going to put away these voices. I'm going to put this, I'm going to set aside some time and make it holy. I'm going to have my work time and I'm going to have this special time to be with God. Because believe it or not, rest is a weapon. Rest is a weapon. It's really hard to tempt somebody who's happy, who's healthy and well-rested. It's really hard to destroy a marriage when the husband and wife are rested, spent soul, giving time with one another, and, uh, and actually like each other. Rest is a weapon. Rest is how you bolster and strengthen your soul to face life's challenges and also chase after the calling that God has for you. And we live in a time where we need to show the world a different rhythm. What if the peace that you have been longing for requires a new solution. Sabbath isn't a new thing. It's been here before Adam and Eve ate the apple. But, what, but for some of us, it's new. We've never tried it before. We've never set out the intention to say, hey, I'm going to take this off. And maybe you have at times, and maybe it's something you need to get back to. Or as you look practically ahead at the season to come, maybe you say, hey, I'm going to work this in. But I strongly believe, at Artisan, we strongly believe in healthy Christians are the best Christians. Healthy Christians are the Christians that the world needs to see. Healthy Christians are the ones that shine the brightest. Healthy Christians are the ones that whenever given an opportunity, they shine the light of Jesus. And you are made on purpose for a purpose and rest being a rhythm that's an intentional part of how God wants us to build our lives right where you are once you close your eyes so Lord I thank you over I thank you for each and every person here under the sound of my voice here with us today God I pray that they would have give themselves the grace for a rhythm of rest God I pray uh, I speak against any lie that wants to distract or wants to discourage your people from resting in the way that you're calling them to. I pray that they would see their responsibilities. I pray that they would see their work. I pray they would see their families as valuable and generative and and wonderful. But Lord, I pray that we would not lose you in the rush of our own lives. So God, I pray that we'd be intentional. Speak to us in this. Lord, I pray that we would find people in our community that are doing this well and that we can learn from them that we can learn from you, that we, would, that we would value longevity over speed, that we wouldn't try to be our own gods and making everything happen and making everything work perfectly. But God, I pray that we would be faithful in the process and rest in what you've done. God, we love you. We praise you. And it's in your mighty name we pray. Come on, say amen. Come on, say amen. Amen and amen. Well, the prayer team's gonna come forward. You can t- stand and...